In 2012, she joined the staff at uh, City of Light, Atlanta, which is uh, MCC Church and just recently Unity Church combined and became part of them. Uh, and it's a church that has a large transgender population. Um, this inspired her to read, to study, to attend gender variant support groups, and listen to the stories of those who are transgender in the congregation. Having learned much, Linda is now an active transgender ally, an engaging trans diversity trainer, and a thought-provoking preacher. She's also the author of a book that was just published, The Bible and the Transgender Experience, How Scripture Supports Gender Variance. Uh, it's published by Pilgrim Press, and she will be doing a book signing and have books for sale following worship today. Uh, we almost didn't uh, get blessed today with uh, Linda's presence because she had uh, been booked to preach at Unity in Rio Rancho, and uh, the pastor um, made that decision and invited Linda, and when the, uh, it was shared with the congregation, um, she discovered that they weren't as inclusive as, as they thought. <laughs> She thought that they were. So let us pray for our sisters and brothers that they perhaps become more accepting and more inclusive and to understand that that means all, all diversity, all people. Uh, personally, um, I think having transgender people among us is, is a true blessing and just another example of, of God's rainbow people. So, Amen. Reverend Linda, let's give her a warm MCC opportunity. Thanks to all of you for letting her invite me here. <laughs> um, it was that church that I was part of back in Atlanta, the MCC there. Uh, Ray and Trudy were also members there, and it was just, it's delightful to be worshiping with them again. Although I said, I told Trudy earlier, I'm not sure if I can handle having her on that side, because she always said about right there. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. That's all. That's that. Okay. All right, okay, you know, we can handle this. Okay. Um, when I came on to that staff four years ago, I really knew nothing about the transgender experience. So I had a lot to learn. And I began my learning process by just listening to the stories of my transgender congregants. And one of the first things I learned from them is that although we often hear the abbreviation LGBTQ, you know, everything all lumped together, implying that it's all the same thing, the reality is that there is a significant difference between being lesbian, gay, and bisexual and being transgender. And the difference is this. As, of course, many of us know, being LG or B is about our sexual orientation. It's about who we're attracted to romantically and physically and spiritually. But being transgender is about one's internal gender identity. Amen. It's about who you know yourself to be on the inside, whether male or female, or maybe a combination of both, or perhaps you don't even resonate with either of those terms. And who you know yourself to be on the inside has absolutely nothing to do with the body parts you have on the outside. Amen. Some of my transgender congregants explained it to me this way. Being lesbian, gay, or bisexual has to do with who you want to go to bed with. Being transgender is about who you go to bed as. <laughs> and that helped me get it. Now, I also learned that when it comes to gender identity, there are many more realities than just the male and female that I grew up knowing about. And all these realities live under the umbrella term transgender. Now, these days, along with being an umbrella term, the word transgender has also come to be used in a more specific way. And when used in this specific sense, it refers to transgender men and trans women, those people whom I mentioned, who, whose internal gender identity does not match the gender that they were assigned at birth. 
And because there's a mismatch there, they often take many steps to align their external selves and their public life with their internal knowing of who they are. The process of making these changes is called transitioning. And thanks to Chris Jenner's transition to Caitlyn Jenner last year, most of us have at least a little idea of what that transitioning process is about. Now, another group of people who were in our congregation and whom I learned live under the transgender umbrella are cross-dressers. And cross-dressers are individuals who don't, who, they do feel comfortable in the gender they were assigned at birth, so they're not seeking to transition. However, it is vitally important for their well-being that they spend at least some time dressed in their less dominant gender and presenting that way and preferably interacting with people while they are cross-dressed. I've had several of my congregants say to me, you know, it's just no fun to get all dressed up and then sit home by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, how much time an individual needs to spend cross-dressed in order to, for their well-being, it varies from individual to individual. With some, it might be once or twice a month. For others, once or twice a week works better for them. But what is the same for all cross-dressers, I've learned, is that both their male and their female selves are very much a part of who they are. And they really do need to express both sides of themselves, at least occasionally. Now, along with getting to know the cross-dressers and the transgender folks in my congregation, I also got to know those who go by the designation gender queer, and they also are part of the, the transgender family. I learned that there are many different ways of being gender queer, but mostly what it's about is that people just don't identify with just male or just female as our, as our culture knows it. Um, they may feel like they're a combination of both, or not either, or one way one day, one way the other. That part is known, that particular expression is known as gender, being gender fluid. And one of our congregants was gender fluid. Carrie might come to church on Sunday morning presenting as a man, and then attend our Tuesday evening women's book group presenting as a woman. Carrie felt equally comfortable, equally aligned in either presentation. And, you know, at first it was a little odd to me, but, you know, after a while I got used to it, and I guess you could say I just learned to roll with it. But what I have learned over the past four years is that many of us are just really not comfortable when it comes to gender, just rolling with it. And I think that, and that I found that that is also true, even for those of us who wholeheartedly want to welcome and love and accept others, because we want to love others just as Christ taught us to. But despite our desire to love all people, many of us find ourselves with just a little bit of discomfort with gender variance. And I believe, personally, that this discomfort comes from two main sources. The first place is this American culture that we live in and that many of us have been raised in. It's a culture that believes strongly in a gender binary. That is, in the notion that there are only two genders. Think about it. Whenever you've gotten to click a box, right, you only had two choices living here in the US. So given what we've imbibed about culture by always being given just two gender choices, you know, it's not surprising that we feel a bit uncomfortable with gender variant individuals. This is the normal discomfort that we experience as humans whenever we encounter something that's unfamiliar to us. Now fortunately, this discomfort is easily alleviated simply by spending more time with gender-variant people. Just as I got more comfortable with Carrie, the more I spent time with them. 
Now, I think that the second source of our discomfort is the belief that is being loudly proclaimed by some Christians today, and that God is the one who has only created just two genders. This belief is what I call the Genesis gender dilemma. It's at the root of our American belief in the gender binary. So we're going to take a look at that this morning in order to maybe help us work through a little of our discomfort and to equip us with something intelligent to say in response to this notion that God only creates two genders. But first, it's time for a joke. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a person who was seeking guidance for their life. So they decided to go to the good book to see what it has to say, their God's message for them. They opened it up, stuck their finger down, and read, and Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> they decided maybe they should try again. So this time they opened it up and read, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> OK, thinking maybe the third time would be a charm, they tried it one more time, and this time they landed on, and what thou doest, do it quickly. <laughs> But this joke illustrates that when it comes to interpreting scripture, it's important that we not just pick out one random verse to base a whole belief system on. And it's important for us to keep this in mind as we consider the Genesis gender dilemma. This dilemma begins in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, in that chapter which was read for us so beautifully this morning. In verse, one, verse 27 there, where it does say, and God created the human ones in God's image, in the image of God, God created them, male and female, God created them. Now what we have to ask ourselves about this verse is just because some aspect of creation is not mentioned in Genesis 1, does that mean that it does not exist as part of God's good creation? Well, let's see. In that Genesis 1 creation story, we also heard how that God created night and day. Nowhere in there does it mention anything about God creating dusk and dawn, but of course we all know that those are two of the most beautiful times of day that God creates, especially here when you get the, the sun shining on the sandiest mountains, right, at sunset. Likewise, nowhere in it's, it says in Genesis 1 that God created the dry lands and the seas. Does it mention anything about shorelines or marshes? You know, those, those areas that can be dry land one hour and then see the next. And yet, of course, we know that everyone loves the beach, although I realize that I can get there a lot quicker in Atlanta than y'all can from here. <laughs> but everyone loves to go to the beach, and no one is saying that marshes are of the devil. So in light of these things, let's reconsider Genesis 1.27. Is it possible that there might be some dusk and dawn when it comes to gender? some shoreline and marshland there. Modern medicine says, yes, this is absolutely the case. The medical community says that there are three different factors that make up our biological sex. And as you can see what they are from this screen here. And that's how they, these three aspects align up in typical males and typical females. But there is more to it than just this. Amen. How many of you, raise your hand please, if you've ever heard the term intersex? Okay, a lot of folks here have. Well, as you may know, intersex persons are individuals whose chromosome patterns, internal reproductive organs, or external genitals do not line up in typical male-female patterns. In fact, research shows 
that there are over 50 different combinations of these three biological factors, including all the different chromosome configurations, that can result in someone being intersex. And that shows just two examples there. Now, I am no expert on the intersex reality. But what I do know that we can conclude from the existence of intersex people is that in the same way that God's creation of night and day includes dusk and dawn, and God's creation of, shore, of dry lands and seas includes shorelines and marshes, God's creation of gender includes male and female and intersex. In fact, in recognition of this gender reality, there are currently 11 different countries in our world that allow for a third gender choice on their passports. They do this out of respect both for their intersex and transgender citizens because the reality is is that transgender people and intersex people have, been, have existed across all time and across all cultures. And some countries are just much further along in their respect um, for these individuals than unfortunately we are here yet in the United States. Now I hope that learning about intersex persons and the 11 countries that recognize genders other than just male and female makes you feel a little more comfortable with gender variance. And I trust it also gives you something constructive to say the next time you're talking with someone who claims that it's a sin to be gender variant and they base their argument on the Genesis gender dilemma, on the notion that God creates only male and female. Of course, after you share your perspectives, that person might come back with, well, Yes, I get it. If God um, didn't create a person to be intersex, though, hmm, then wouldn't choosing to be a gender other than what God created that person to be, wouldn't that be a sin against the divine order? That's an interesting point. You know, basically what this person is saying is that it's still wrong to choose to be transgender. How would we respond to that? <laughs> yes, well, um, as most LGB people whom I have ever spoken with would say, I didn't have a choice about this. This was not my choice. And I can tell you that all the trans people that I've ever spoken with would tell you exactly the Amen. same thing. Amen. Um, and I would also respond by asking that person, why they assume that, their gen that one's gender is determined by one's divinely created genitals. Because personally, from all I've learned, I believe that our gender is determined by our divinely created gender identities. And research is now confirming that our gender identities are, are an inherent part of us. In fact, brain researchers have done studies showing that there may be a link between neural development and our gender identities. But these preliminary research findings are not what has ultimately convinced me that our genders should be determined by our gender identities. Now what has ultimately been most persuasive to me has been the stories of innocent children as young as two and three and four years old who are telling their astounded parents, no mommy, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl, or vice versa. The internet contains hundreds of stories of such children, and I'd like to share just one of those with you this morning. A mom wrote <coughs> on her blog, my child, at age three, told me he was a girl. He looked me in the eyes and said, Mama, something went wrong in your tummy that made me come out as a boy instead of a girl. Since age two, he'd been begging me to dress him in the pretty clothes he saw the little girls wearing 
and had been obsessed with the things little girls often love, like princesses and fairies and the color pink. At first, I assumed the whole thing was a phase. I said he could like pink and he could play with dolls, but then he had a boy body, so he was a boy. When he kept asserting his girlhood, I tried to encourage more masculine activities, suggesting karate classes when he wanted to sign up for ballet. I encouraged more play dates with boys and more time with his dad. But ultimately, I couldn't stomach the idea of denying my child the things he loved, nor bear to see him so unhappy. All right. My real turning point came about a year after he first told me he was a girl. I attended a support group for the parents of transgender and gender non-conforming kids and heard a story that kept me up at night for weeks afterward. Through her tears, a young mother told us what happened to her five-year-old when she took the advice of a well-meaning psychologist. I took away all his dolls, all his most made favorite things. I told him he was a boy and that's that because that's what the psychologist told me to do. Within a couple of months, her kindergartner had stopped speaking and was diagnosed with severe depression. I almost lost him, she saw. The story haunted me because my child had recently begun a similar disappearing act. After months of fighting me, I'm a girl. The kid was giving up. He stopped correcting me when I used his hated boy name, shrugged when I suggested karate lessons yet again. Another mom in the same, in the same support group witnessed the same phenomena in her child, and she described it perfectly. My four-year-old looked like a tired little old man. I finally decided that enough was enough. I sat my child down, looked him in the eyes, and asked him the question one last time. Do you really want to be a girl? I don't want to be a girl, Mama, he said. I am a girl. <laughs> then that mom wrote, three years on, and I am the mother of a stunningly happy and confident transgender daughter. Based on the testimony of innocent children like this, and the testimony of transgender adults who have also known from childhood that their gender identity did not match their genitals, and based on the fact that there are intersex people whose anatomies are neither clearly male or female, and on research suggesting that there are biological <coughs> factors contributing to gender variance, mm -hmm. I personally conclude that our gender is not determined by our divinely created genitals, but it is determined by our divinely created gender identities. Amen. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, each of us will have to come to that conclusion on our own about what we believe it is that determines gender identities. And that will be our challenge as a nation and as states and as a whole country. I trust that the perspectives that I've shared with you today have inspired you to maybe reconsider some of the things you learned early on about gender. But don't stop here. I'd encourage you to learn even more you can start with the websites that are on the resources page of, of my website, which is transformationjourneysww.com. You can read my book on your own, or it does have a discussion guide in the back if you'd like to read it with a group. And I just encourage you to learn more about everyone under the transgender umbrella. And trust me, the more you come to know gender variant individuals, the more you'll come to love them, just as I have. And then we will all be able to wholeheartedly act on Christ's teaching to love our neighbors as ourselves. Yeah, amen. May it be so.